Uh, it's a great yeah. pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Uh, Avi Kuperschlag uh, for, today's, uh, for today's webinar. Avi, uh, Dr. Kuperschlag, thanks very much. Dr. Dr. Kuperschlag is an accomplished oral surgeon. Just a few, minute, a few, uh, few notes about uh, Dr. Kuperschlag. Uh, he's uh, an accomplished oral surgeon and faculty at the Oral and Maxillofacial Department of Kaunas Hospital in Kaunas, Lithuania. He is a renowned uh, lecturer on uh, tissue regeneration and implantology. I met Dr. Kuperschlag a couple of years ago, and I was really impressed with uh, the clinical, his clinical work, his research work, and specifically, obviously, utilizing autologous tissue, uh, and especially dentin graft, uh, to achieve highly aesthetic, long-term predictable results. So Dr. Kuperschlag will definitely focus on techniques that I believe you'll be able to implement in your practice as soon as we all get back to work, right? Uh, with that, uh, just before I transfer it over to uh, Dr. Kuperschlag, my name is Amit Binderman. I'm with Cometa Bio. Uh, as far as Q&A, uh, questions and answers, if you have questions at any time during the lecture, uh, please feel free to use the chat box uh, and uh, type in your questions and we will either respond to your questions right away or we'll keep them for the end of the lecture and then I promise you we'll answer as many questions as we possibly uh, can, okay? So uh, with that, I'd like to transfer the lecture to Dr. Kuperschlag uh, and uh, thanks again for joining. We have over 200 people on the call, it's great. Uh, give me one second, I'll transfer it over. Let's see here, one second. Okay. Okay, hello everybody, just one second. Okay, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. I mean, okay, perfect. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so uh, first of all, just let me open this window perfect okay so thank you for the very fine introduction i made i'm very humble um it is my great pleasure to be here tonight i want to welcome all of our participants say good evening to the guys from europe and the middle east good day good afternoon to the guys from the other side uh, the us and canada my name is dr Ravi kuperschlag i'm an oral surgeon i focus my practice on implant dentistry and the purpose of my presentation is basically to show you as much of clinical data that I can in order for you guys to be able to implement it the following day after all of this uh, quarantine, corona stuff ends and passes it. So uh, let's jump right in. What's on today's agenda? Well, uh, we'll be discussing uh, grafting materials, the pros and cons. Then, of course, we'll be discussing the reason why should I choose dentin as a grafting material. We'll be talking about PRF or uh, focusing a little bit more on LPRF, on leukocyte-enriched uh, platelet rich fibrin. Then we will talk about, obviously, the indication uh, using uh, dentin grafting, which contains a ridge socket preservation, immediate implant placement, Impact the third, third molars. This is where I get the most the eyebrows raised when I, when I, uh, uh, when I uh, state that as an indication for, uh, for grafting. But uh, stay tuned, then you will see why. And obviously, I will give you uh, clinical tips and tricks that um, I established with, from my experience, from my clinical experience. And the whole purpose of it is pretty much to make your life easier when you're uh, doing surgical. So uh, before we jump in, into the team, let's talk about for when do we use biomaterials or more uh, when do I use them because the, the list of indication is very vast. So I'm just gonna state out the most uh, pronounced ones, uh, the, the, the most obvious ones and the most common ones that they use. So the first one is obviously socket or ridge preservation. We extract the tooth, we fill it with biomaterial, in this case dentin, we close it somehow, and in this case with a PRF uh, plug, and we basically pretty much uh, prepare the area for future implantation. Then uh, obviously we do a GBR, 
both lateral or uh, vertical augmentation. In this case, uh, we are using uh, collagen um, membrane uh, fixed with uh, tissue tags. We place, uh, it's pretty much a sausage, a sausage technique here. We have a mix of 50-50 of autologous and xenograft and, and uh, xeno type uh, material. We close uh, it with the, with the membrane. On top of that, we place the PRF membrane, the LPRF membrane, and this is very important. And we will get to, we will get to it uh, later. Why I like to place, and this is a question that I always get: Why do I like to place the PRF over the membrane rather than over the the graft and on top of that the collagen? So I have, I think, a very logical explanation. For that. And we suture and we uh, move on. Obviously. Uh, for immediate implant placement, filling in the jump gap. One second, I'll just close in this window. Yeah, so uh, filling in the jump gap during immediate implant placement, I think roughly around 70% of my implantation uh, includes immediate implant placement. And uh, we often see a case like this, which is a canine that has just been extracted. We see here the, the osteotomy with the dancer birth. Thank you, Professor Mazo for the technique, we place the implant and pretty much the distance in between the buccal wall and the implant body is what we refer to as jump gap. It has to be grafted specially in anterior maxilla where we have very thin buccal plate. Uh, about uh, posterities we can discuss, but in my opinion, um, when doing immediate implant placement, we, um, we, have, we, we can't cross the jump gap uh, in a case like this, it must be uh, issued. So in this case, sorry, in this case, uh, I close it again with the LPRF and the patient now is just ready to go home and wait for the future. We can also uh, call this not exactly a jump gap, but more of a, let's say socket preservation because here we have an upper first molar that was extracted and implant was placed. Uh, I performed a closed uh, crustal approach sinus lift uh, using dense birds. And now basically we have a three, we had a three through the teeth that was extracted and uh, we are dealing with three different sockets. So the sockets are grafted. In this case, we fabricate an individual healing abutment using flow composite, close it and the patient is ready uh, for the future. And this is, this allows us not only to hold the, um, biomaterial, but also to maintain a nice emergence process. What about extraction of the impacted third molars, wisdom teeth extraction? Why are we doing this? And we will uh, address this uh, question a little bit into more depth later on with the, with, the, um, with the lecture, but on one leg, and we will again emphasize that the extraction process itself, the surgery, is uh, quite aggressive. We need quite a lot of bone removal. This is, has nothing to do with our technique. It's just, uh, the, just the situation that we're dealing with. And we're basically creating a future, let's call it future problem, future defect. So this is a way to address this defect and we will talk about it uh, more uh, thoroughly soon. So uh, speaking about uh, grafting materials, uh, their pro pros and cons, uh, we have a few types of them. I'll just really shortly mention them. We have autogenous bone, which is pretty much the golden standard, right? Uh, everybody who learns GBR always learns that the autogenous bone is, is the golden standard. Why? Uh, because it's the only type of grafting material that's both osseoinductive as well as osseoconductive, okay? Uh, we have uh, no immune uh, suppression. Uh, the patient uh, host uh, accepted, and we have osseo induction, meaning that we have new real bone formation. It also has a fast turnover. However, and that's a big, big plus, it requires, um, it requires a secondary surgical site for harvesting. And uh, another, let's say, uh, con or, uh, or um, minus that we have using autogenous bone is that it's a little bit more, not a little bit, it's more technique sensitive, especially if we're talking about blocks. And I love doing blocks. I do a lot of query technique, uh, which is uh, a cortical uh, bone plate. 
However, it's very technique sensitive and uh, we, must, we must remember. Also, now if the patient wants to have a secondary surgical site, right? I mean, I think that it's a, it's a normal request, especially if we're doing somewhere on the aesthetic zone on the anterior maxilla. Imagine harvesting a bone block from the, from the ascending granules, right? Completely other uh, region in the, in the oral cavity. And patients really don't like it. Us surgeons, we love it, but, but patients, not so much. Then uh, we have, of course, allogenic bone. Uh, it's harvested from a uh, human cadaver through a donor bank. It has the fast to medium turnover. It contains BNPs, bone for genetic proteins. However, it's not osseoinductive, it's socioconductive. And in my hands, and also some authors uh, mentioned that um, it's a little bit less predictable in the long term uh, run stability wise. Some authors even claim to have about 30, 35% of uh, resorption over a five year period of time. Uh, from a personal point of view, when I started doing GBI, I started with allogenic. And when I reopen, amazing. You see bleeding bone, everything looks nice. But three, four years after, you start seeing recession. And this is something that in my hands, it's quite, uh, quite uh, unpredictable. Then we have the xeno, uh, xenogenic uh, material, which is uh, bovine or uh, porcine. It has higher contact of minerals. This is uh, also why you see it a little bit different in the x-rays. Sorry. It has slow or no turnover or no turnover. And the biggest issue with that uh, is that we don't really have real bone formation. We have more of a bony-like uh, substance. Now, remember, this material does not resorb. So everybody who works with xenografts, and I personally work quite a lot with xenografts, I still do. When we reopen, we find a lot, a lot of um, unintegrated uh, uh, particles. So yes, they are type of a filler. Uh, it maintains its volume, but it's not real bone. It really isn't. So um, looking through the table, I didn't mention one uh, type, which is synthetic. Um, I, cho I choose not to talk about it because uh, we are a little bit uh, lacking in long-term information. A lot of companies really promise us uh, the world and beyond, but I think that uh, we should wait at least to have five-year uh, post-op uh, data and be very, very responsible by uh, using it. I'm not saying that I never use it. I do sometimes, sorry, but uh, we must be... Um, of course, uh, responsible. So obviously the golden standard is the autogenous. However, as I said, we have the problem of harvesting and having a secondary surgical site and also the technique sensitivity. So basically it's a great material. I mean, we can not call it a material, right? It's our own, it's, it's real bone and blood and, and cells and so on and so on. However, it requires a much more aggressive surgery. So what if I can tell you that uh, you can use autogenous graft or autogenous materials that have slow resorption, which is quite similar to xenograft, right? The autogenous bone has a very fast resorption. It has a very fast turnover. And it does not require a surgical site. <clears throat> well, um, if we would be having this conversation, let's say, 10 years ago, then you say, ah, Avi, you're a charlatan. But I'm not. And um, this is where Cometa Bio and Cometa Bio's Dentine Grinder comes into use. So uh, in 1967, it was first published that uh, dentin is containing a bone for genetic proteins by uh, Utrecht, uh, the, the team in UCLA. And in 2003, it was first described as a grafting material for a sinus floor elevation by a team of, of uh, South Korean. Now, dentin, has uh, inorganic and unorganic, sorry, inorganic and organic components that are quite similar to those of human bone. Okay, in dentin, the inorganic content is about 70 75 percent, uh, the organic is about uh, 20 percent. If we compare it to the alveolus, to the alveolar bone, then we have quite similar numbers, but and this is a very, very important. Uh, data that at least 90% of the organic content on, of dentin is type 1 collagen. This plays a very important role in bone formation and mineralization. And as we mentioned before, it also contains BMPs, which are very important for osseoinduction. 
So how did I came across uh, denting grinding? Well, uh, this is a photo of me with much more hair. I was a student here. I think I was either in uh, fourth or fifth year. And I came across this article. This is a literature review from a South Korean team uh, about the, the properties of dentin uh, using uh, for, for grafting materials. And I mean, I was stunned. I read this. I was still a student. Uh, this also motivated me uh, to do my uh, final uh, thesis work uh, as a student uh, about uh, dentin, about the, the, the grafting possibilities of dentin. And I read this article and I was blown away. And I thought to myself, I mean, why aren't we funding this? Why doesn't everybody use this, right? This, this is the, 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 the number one question. Why isn't, why isn't dentin being used routinely in oral surgery? And uh, then I figure out why, because in, uh, in South, sorry, not in North Korea, but uh, in South Korea, they have what's called a Korean tooth bank. And back in the day, and that, that was uh, a few years ago, um, when you extracted a tooth, you give it away by, by a courier or however, uh, they demineralize it and send it back to you. But this process takes time. I'm not even talking about the, the financial model of it. And um, I mean, if I said that uh, we're using for ridge preservation and for socket preservation for immediate implants, 70%, 80% maybe of our indication has blown away. So yeah, that's, that's, why, uh, that's why it wasn't known. And uh, what I like to um, use for metaphor is this cute donkey. And uh, the fact of the matter is that we are a herd. We are followed by uh, biomaterial companies, uh, colleagues, opinion leaders. And uh, if everyone says that they need to do one thing, they usually do it. However, a lot of times, if you just think straight, you can figure it out much more comfortably and easily. So the, the, the donkey was committed here, right? So I yeah, mean, so that's when I came across uh, Cometa Bio. They were a very small uh, company back in the day. I contacted them. I uh, already graduated um, and I wanted to get as much information as possible. And I remember just maybe, <clears throat> maybe a couple of months of maybe three, four months maximum. After I started working, I already started implementing uh, this protocol. And uh, this is a very, very sim simple and easy protocol to use and very predictable. Uh, what they uh, found out is this, uh, the, the, this type of protocol that consists of, first, you have to clean away uh, the tooth from any soft tissue remnants, from filling materials, from my carriers and so on and so on. Please make sure that you're using a surgical uh, Tungsten carbide or just carbide burr. Do not use a diamond coated burr because it doesn't cut. It generates heat. We don't want the heat there. Uh, then we clean them off, dry them with a, with a gauze, make sure that they're nice and dry. We can take the, the air gun and, and spritz it with the, spray it with air. We uh, grind and sort it. Uh, it takes 13 seconds. Well, I think a little bit more because I uh, run it through several cycles. So let's say instead of 13, it takes 30 seconds. Not a big deal. Then uh, we uh, clean and rinse it. And this takes also about six minutes and we're good to go. We have uh, this amazing grafting material. Now, uh, what are pretty much the, the clinical problems uh, in using extracted teeth as grafting material? So first of all, we need to get the correct size of granules, right? The, the, the optimal size, in my opinion, is not larger than a thousand, let's say a thousand, three hundred thousand, four hundred microns. I like to use in any type of uh, biomaterial, small to medium sized granules. I never use the big ones, uh, especially when I'm in the in the sinus. I just find uh, I just find it more risky to handle. So uh, and obviously smaller than two hundred and fifty microns will go through phagocytosis. So uh, the immune uh, response will will treat it as a threat and will just be <clears throat> completely resorbed. Then, 
what about the caries and the, the bacterial infiltration? I mean, a tooth is not a sterile thing, right? Uh, tooth is in the, in the oral cavity. We know uh, how, uh, how bacteria full the oral cavity is. And uh, we will expect some uh, caries and bacterial infiltration to our, to our tooth. How do we address that? And this is where Cometa Bio shines. This is their, their big uh, breakthrough, in my opinion. And can all uh, extracted teeth be used as grafting materials? And I'm here uh, pointing you towards endo-treated uh, tooth, and we will get to that in, in a second. So um, it is a very complicated process. In order to get the exact uh, granule size, all you need to do is press a button. I'm joking, it's extremely simple. Basically, the, the, the dentin grinder does it for yourself, does it for ourselves, I mean. You just press a button and it grinds it and it sorts it. It has a filtering mechanism that uh, maintains the granules on that specific, uh, on that specific side, size. So it pretty much does it for ourselves. It's uh, idiot proof. What about caries and bacterial infiltration? And again, if you take a look at the, at the, at the grinder itself, it's pretty much a high quality, high tech coffee grinder. It comes from, from, from the same idea, but this is where uh, their breakthrough is and they uh, have developed this infection solution uh, that is uh, used in order to, to disinfect it. I'm specifically saying disinfect it and not sterilize it because we don't have a sterile graft, but we don't need the graft to be sterile because it's autogenous. <clears throat> um, so uh, we just apply it on the grinded uh, particles on the graft. We wait for five minutes. After five minutes, we take a gauze, a sterile gauze. We soak up the excess uh, liquid. Then we place a buffing solution. The buffing solution pretty much neutralizes it. We place it. We uh, soak it again with another sterile gas, throw these gases away. And again, we uh, fill up this uh, Depen dish with, with the solution and we're good to go. That's it. So it takes five minutes to disinfect and maybe 20 seconds to, uh, to, to buff it and neutralize it. Very, very simple, very easy to use. And uh, believe me, you can teach your, uh, your assistant to, use it, to do it for you. It's very, very simple. What about endodontically treated teeth? Well, I'm gonna start from the beginning, no. And uh, I see uh, a lot of uh, people advocating on Facebook that they can remove the endomaterial and the gutta perca. Well, obviously you don't want these uh, materials, the, the synthetic uh, materials that are most probably contaminated inside our graft, right? The other thing is even if you think visually that, that you are able to, to remove everything, in some places, they use arsen-based um, um, the, the, the pulpation paste. Uh, some of the sealers are toxic and so on. And believe me, us surgeons that worked in the OR, we know that when uh, you play around, you mess around with these things, and when we have, uh, when we have a complication, it's not a complication, it's a disaster. It will lead to necrosis. We will need to do resection, and I just want to avoid it categorically. I think Cometa Bia also emphasizes not uh, not uh, to use endodontically treated teeth. So I am very much uh, insisting on endodontically treated teeth to be con contraindicated for for grafting. Unfortunately, now uh, let's talk a little bit about LPRF. Okay. Um, the main objective of it is to achieve new uh, angiogenesis, right? New formation of blood vessels. So the mechanism, as we all learned in second year of, of uh, studies during uh, physiology is that we have injury, then bleeding, then we have uh, a blood coagulation from the blood. We have a fibrin clot that releases uh, growth factors and, uh, from, from the platelet and the leukocytes. Uh, they have some cell communication and, and uh, we have eventually wound healing. All of that is, is, is very nice. Uh, what, is it, what does it give us, practically speaking, and I'm not gonna teach you the, the, the microbiology or the biology of LPRF because uh, people can do it much, much better than me. And uh, we don't have time for that. 
So basically what it does, it releases a uh, growth factor for, for up to seven days. Uh, it's used also as a ma matrix recipient for growth factors. Now, these two are very, uh, these two properties, the next one um, that I'm gonna mention are very, very um, significant from a clinical point of view. It does not resorb its epithelial lines. And this is why I always put it on top of the, as the, as the last layer before I suture, on top of the of collagen membrane if, I, if I'm using one, because if I will have wound, wound adhesions, right, wound opening, we all know that if we have wound opening, we start over, right? We're removed, we start over. In that case, if it's still at the, at the membrane level, at the LPRF uh, level, then I know that I can leave it like this. It will eventually epithelialize and we will have growth and closure of, of, of new gingiva. I only instruct my patients for good oral hygiene. It also has antibacterial properties, which means that we have no plaque accumulation. And this is also extremely important. You will not find any plaque on there if you, if you leave it uh, for spontaneous healing. And um, it, of course, uh, re reduces the, the, the use of antibiotics by quite a bit. So what's the protocol? Uh, we take a 21 gauge uh, needle, <clears throat> okay, it's a butterfly needle. We collect, we do a phlebotomy, we, we collect uh, nine to eight to nine milli milliliters in the rat cap tubes. We centrifugate them at uh, 2700 RPM using the centrifuge for at least 12 minutes, okay? Avi? Yes. Avi, uh, can, can, are we, Give me one minute. I want to pause this for one minute uh, because we have more people joining us and we need to reclaim the host for a second because of the technical difficulty we had. So No problem. I'm, 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 I'm stopping for a second. Okay, so hold on. Yasmin, if you can uh, take the host and, uh, and uh, bring more people in in the waiting room to join us. And uh, also, if I may ask everyone if you can uh, mute your video Okay, uh, you know, so you can still you can still hear and see, but just mute your video. It's okay. Right. I, I hear nobody. So. Avi, you can continue. Yeah, I, I hear you. Yes, ma'am. All right, we have fifty-five new people in the chat. Go ahead. Excellent. Okay, so welcome to 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 all the new participants joining in i'm just about uh, to discuss the lprf protocol how to get the lprf and i'm just gonna gonna repeat it uh, from from the beginning so uh we take uh, we we're using a 21 gauge butterfly needle we collect blood in the red cap tubes uh, we have about eight to nine millimeter milliliters sorry of blood uh, we centrifugate them at 2700 rpm uh, with our centrifuge for 12 minutes after 12 minutes, of course, if the patient is taking the anticoagulative drugs, then we can prolong it for 18 minutes, up to 18 minutes. Uh, this uh, you verify during the anamnesis and when you take the patient's history. After the centrifugation is over, uh, we take off uh, the, 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 the clot from the, from the tubes. That's true. We place them uh, in the, we, we separate them from the red uh, blood cells and we <laughs> place them in the box, this is how it looks. Yeah. Someone, I hear somebody, Yasmin, can you just uh, mute everybody for me? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we put, um, we place the clots. In okay, now we're good? Okay. So uh, we have the, the clots, we close the cover of it, press it down and then we have uh, the LPRF member. Now, from my personal subjective point of view, why uh, did I start using them? First of all, it's evidence-based. If you go into PubMed, um, you type down LPRF, you get over 1,800 results. So uh, it, it is evidence-based, but I mean, there are a lot of things that are evidence-based. Do they work in our hands? Are they predictable? And just a little bit of a personal experience, when I just started practicing oral surgery, I was working in two different clinics. In one clinic, we had the centrifuge and my assistant was a certified nurse. She used to draw blood for, for my patient, for every patient, simple extraction. I take two tubes of, 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 uh, of uh, blood and we make uh, membranes and we fill up the socket 
and all the way to the more uh, serious or let's say complex surgeries. And in the other clinic, the same only without. I didn't have any, any, any PRF, any nothing. And I saw with my eyes and I, he I heard the patient post-op uh, complaints that are much less the healing of soft tissue. And this is the main, main idea. And I will show you a couple of examples how soft tissue reacts to, PR to LPRF. It's amazing. It's, it's simply astonishing. Uh, so I thought to myself, okay, I, I have to start using it on a regular basis. And I went down and I bought the centrifuge and I'm using it for over six years now, I think, maybe five. And uh, I have uh, great results, really amazing results. So um, when I'm preparing uh, for a course, for a class, I always go through the literature. And here we have a very uh, nice uh, systemic review from 2017. Look at the names, Zucchelli, Pico, Salame, even Joseph Shukun, uh, Ziv, you are missing there. How can it be? Um, so um, the conclusion is very, very simple, that um, we have a very strong evidential support for periodontal and soft tissue repair. And this is what I'm talking about. I mean, gingiva, soft tissue heals amazingly and it reacts amazingly with, with PRF. And also um, we have little data, that was in 2017, now we have a little bit more data, uh, but still regarding G GBR, guided bone regeneration, we have a little bit of uh, work to do. We still, uh, in some cases, uh, cannot rely strictly on, on LPRF uh, for, for, for membrane. So how do I use it? Uh, practically speaking, right? What have you been talking to us about everybody? Every agent that sells the tubes and the centrifuge is saying the same thing. Practically speaking, how do I use them? And uh, it's very simple. I use it as a puncture, meaning that I take a membrane, I puncture a hole in it, I uh, place my healing abutment through it. Uh, when doing immediate implant placement, this is a, a lower for smaller. We place an implant, we grafted the area, we suture it, I cleaned uh, off some of the particles there after I sutured it. And look what happens five days after when the patient comes uh, for a suture removal, look at these uh, defects in, in soft tissue. Only five days. These are my pictures. I can show it to whoever, whoever wants it. Amazing. And this is something predictable and predictability is the key for success in any field of, 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 of medicine, not only dentistry. Everybody can rep reproduce it. It doesn't only work in my hands, and that's what, what makes it um, uh, so so nice. And I mean, it's easy to use. The, the, there's no uh, fancy surgical uh, techniques about it. You puncture a hole with the scalpel, and you just place two sutures. One suture, single interrupted suture, nothing fancy. Now, uh, LPRF and autogenous dentine, in my opinion, uh, can you just please unmute everybody uh, for me? So uh, in my opinion, um, they are best friends, best buddies, let's call them like this. Uh, combining these two, we can make what's called an LPRF dentine block. Uh, some people refer to it as sticky bone or sticky dentine. Uh, we, we call it a dentine block. And um, how do we do it? One second. Okay. Hang on. You guys see me, I hope. Okay, it just popped up a little, a few slides uh, in advance. But let's just go through each section separately. So uh, when we are drawing blood, we are using one tube without uh, any coagulation. Uh, additives okay this will be always the last tube that we uh, that we draw make sure of it we centrifugate all the tubes together for three minutes under uh, 27,000 rpm so same rpm only now we're uh, centrifugating them for three minutes after three minutes we remove that tube that has no uh, coagulation agent 
and uh, we uh, continue on with the centrifugation for the rest of the tubes for nine more minutes. So in total, we said for membranes, 12 minutes and uh, 2700 RPM, okay? We draw the fibrinogen serum from that tube to a sterile syringe. We put it on the side. We can use it up to around 25, 30 minutes. But once it's made, you can leave it for hours. After the centrifugation, we make the, the membranes uh, the same way, that, the same fashion that I just showed you. Then we take two membranes, chop them finely with scissors, mix them with the, with the dentin, and make sure that the dentin is as dry as possible. Just use a gauze, dry it up, mix it nice and thoroughly, and then we uh, spray it with, with, the, um, with the syringe. We mix it slowly, don't over mix it, don't be very hectic about it, just take your time and believe in it, and it should happen within 10, 20, 30 minutes, a second, I'm sorry, second, what a, what a, what a, what a big difference, 20 seconds, and you will get a dentin, wonderful dentin block that looks like this. And a little bit more focused. Like this. This is very, very malleable, very easy to use. You can press it down, you can manipulate it, you can force it into, into uh, a four or three bo uh, wall bony defects. Very, very simple to use. Now, uh, Ziv Mazo, Professor Ziv Mazo, who's a great mentor of mine, uh, teaches a lot of things. And during one of his courses, I came across with uh, the term green dentistry. And out of all of the things that he uh, emphasizes, I don't think that the green dentistry uh, gets the, the, the respect that it deserves. So give green dentistry a little bit, pump, push, push it more. And I just love it. I, I find this, this term to be fantastic uh, to explain what I'm doing because green dentistry, I'm taking medical waste, right? An extracted tooth, okay? That was supposed to end up in the trash can. I take blood from the patient. I mix it up and we have this amazing biomaterial and we are green here. Uh, so uh, that's just amazing. I'll just show you a quick example. I'll, I'll show you the, the full case uh, at the end. But here we extracted uh, an impacted uh, wisdom tooth of a lady. I will mm, explain that case a little bit more thoroughly and went on with uh, placing an immediate implant here. We grafted it with with uh, with a dentin. Here we have some uh, PRF in the in the socket, and cover all up with PRF ponchos and uh, and uh, membrane. And that's how I sutured it. And that's how I sent the patient home. And you might sit at home. Obviously, everyone is home now, and think, "Why are you showing this to us? This is nonsense. Look look at this terrible surgery." believe in green dentistry. Look at the results five days after. Not a week, not a week, not a month, not 10 days, five days after a suture removal. Look how beautiful the tissue is. Look how healthy it is. Look at the, the volume. Look at the maintenance of, 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 of tissue. Before, what a mess, and after. And this is something that you will get every time. And I'm not, I, I don't claim to be some kind of extra fantastic surgeon. I do my best, but this is something that is very, very predictable. And I'm sure that everyone can get the, 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 the same result. Think about it, this combination of, of dentin and, 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 uh, and LPRF. This is growth factors over growth factors. This is so rich in, in all of these, um, in all of these cells that help tissue repair and regeneration that we are expecting it to heal uh, quite well. And this is her already after we delivered the, prost the, the, the prosthetics. We use uh, mostly uh, um, full counter, that means uh, monolithic uh, zirconium uh, screw retained uh, this time. Okay, I'm sorry for the low quality. Uh, corona that, that does not allow me to go, go to my office and uh, do a print, uh, do screenshots. So all I have to show you is that when I did the CT, I was so amazed that I took some photos with my 
with the with my phone just 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 to show everybody this was done using xenograft this was also um, an immediate uh, implant uh, case look at the difference in the opacity now this is two and a half months post op where is the dentin where is the the host bone i cannot see the difference look at the cross section where is the host bone i don't know and this to me shows regeneration this to me really shows a good uh, result and good outcome okay so uh being autogenous and talking about green dentistry let's talk about the indications right again the same indication we have socket preservation extracted a tooth grounded it up disinfected here it's mixed with the with the exudate from the from the PRF uh, that is left at the bottom of the PRF box. We fill it up and just three sutures. We close it with a PRF plug. That's how it looks. Uh, the patient, I'll, I'll show you a little bit in more detail this case. Also, uh, the patient later on had a provisional in Maryland adhesive bridge at the time of, of before he, we, we placed an implant. What about immediate implant placement? Well, um, this is a lower uh, lower first molar that I, I just extracted, and using Dunsabers again, Viv, thank you for for the for for the info for the knowledge. Look how nicely I was able to to to, to expand the septum. This is why uh, also densification also works with 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 the concept of green dentistry because we're not destroying anything here. We're only manipulating the bone that, that that that's amazing again if uh, you would show me this photo seven years ago i would say it's photoshop but it's not and everybody can can get uh, the same uh, the same result i was fortunate enough to have a little piece of that tooth that i extracted it was uh, it was a vital tooth it wasn't endodontically treated we placed the implant grafted the site and again poncho and happy patient happy doctor and believe me when I uh, say to the patient, uh, dear sir or dear madam, I'm going to use bone taken from a cow and close it with a membrane taken from a pig, or I will use your own uh, tissue or your own blood and, and uh, your own tooth for grafting material, you'll be surprised to know what, what, what's the most common answer. Now, uh, talking about uh, indications, I want to emphasize uh, this topic. Uh, I just released, uh, published a paper about it. And it's, we use it, we use uh, the grafting material to graft a post extraction socket of an impacted wisdom tooth. Why would you even consider grafting a wisdom tooth? For what? Uh, this article uh, should be free in Cometa Bio's uh, webpage if you want to check it out. So um, basically it goes the following. Um, the horizontally impacted wisdom teeth, one second, let's wait for it to pop up. The surgery as is, and it's regardless to your technique, and I'm going to talk about technique in, in, in a minute, and I'll give you the, those, those uh, great clinical tips. But as is, it's a very aggressive surgery. I mean, if I have a fully impacted wisdom tooth, I have to do the osteotomy, I have to expose the tooth. It has nothing to do with my technique. This is the situation that I'm dealing with, okay? So uh, I am creating a bony defect. And um, due to the large osteotomy, like I said, we're creating a, a, a bony defect and we're expecting to have a pocket depth of uh, four to seven millimeters. Okay, uh, we have uh, literature published about this and also it correlates with, with, with my uh, results. <clears throat> so basically the, the, the surgery itself is quite aggressive and we are unfortunately making, making a defect. We're causing a defect and we're making it. Um, now, <clears throat> a lot of people who practice oral surgery uh, will probably relate to what I'm saying now. Most of the patients that um, 
that we're getting, uh, that we're extracting the, the, the impact of wisdom teeth are uh, referred patients. They come from other clinics. Uh, we ex do the extraction. Sometimes they come back a week after to remove the sutures. Sometimes the, the, their own doctor removes it for us. That's it, we forget about them. But imagine most of these patients are young patients. They're in their 20s, they're in their teens, most of them, right? Not, not all of them. We're causing a defect that that patient has to live uh, uh, with for another 80 years, maybe 100, hopefully, right? Uh, can we do something about it? And the answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes, we can. And second, the uh, computer uh, is uh, okay. So let's look at this, at this case, this number 48, sorry for my American friends. I'm using the European numbering system. So we have a lower right uh, third molar. And look here at the distal aspect of the, of the, um, of the wisdom tooth. We have a pocket here. There's nothing to discuss, right? Now imagine that I all also need to remove the buccal area, the buccal aspect. So that means that the, um, the option of a five, six uh, wall, sorry, the five, six uh, bony wall defect and uh, spontaneous healing is not so much in a case like this. And that has nothing to do with my technique. It's just the situation, the given situation. So in this case, we extract the tooth, look at the amount of, 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 of bone that is lost here. And again, instead of throwing it out, instead of having medical waste, we have this amazing grafting material. We grind it up, disinfect it. We place it in the socket, suture it up, and the patient will go happy and uh, live their life. So uh, in, in our uh, study, uh, the mean uh, pocket depth assessment uh, was uh, done three and 12 months post-operative after, after surgery. We had uh, in total 24 cases. And look at the number. At 12 months, the study group, the group that was uh, grafted, the, the, the control group was not grafted. Uh, had a pocket depth of 1.15 millimeter. That's an amazing number because the, the physiological depth is up to two uh, millimeters. I think in some cases we can also accept three, but here it's 1.15. And look at the, the, the probing depth of, of the control group, 4.45. This co co correlates uh, and co coexists with, with the data that, that uh, is already in the literature. And pocket depth means periodontal defect, periodontal pocket. And again, imagine these patients are young. They have to live with that uh, for, uh, for many, many years. So basically we have a new paradigm here. And again, I am emphasizing it, that we're taking medical waste and turning it into a great grafting material and it improves our patients uh, long-term health and reduces the risk for future complications. So very nice. Now, being aut autogenous, right? And this is where the, 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 the practical part of, of, the, of the lecture begins. So thinking about all these indications, right? We talked about uh, socket preservation, immediate implant, uh, wisdom teeth extraction, but the key for success is performing atraumatic surgery. And I'm specifically saying atraumatic, not minimal invasive. We are invasive. We're raising a flat, we're invasive. Uh, sometimes the, the invasiveness can sometimes uh, be di dictated by, the, by the, exist, the, the existing factors. We don't have control over it. Uh, so it all begins with a true atraumatic extraction. And I'm going to explain to you and uh, share with you uh, my protocol of uh, achieving that and hopefully you guys can implement it in your daily practice. So the aim of, uh, of the atraumatic tooth extraction is to preserve as much uh, hard and soft tissue as clinically possible and using the right instruments together with the correct technique. You, can have, you can't have one without the other. So you can have awesome technique, but you don't have the instruments, you will have to be more aggressive or more traumatic. You have all the most fancy, uh, fanciest and most expensive uh, instruments. If you don't have the right technique, you will be more aggressive. So uh, speaking about, about the instruments, <laughs> sorry. 
we have uh, three major instruments, the periotome luxator and high-speed carbide uh, or tungsten carbide surgical bird. What's missing? I'm not, uh, I cannot hear you, so don't scream forceps in your living room, but I didn't mention forceps. Forceps is not a part of, 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 of our, uh, of our uh, instrument uh, case. Forceps are only used at the last, last, and I cannot emphasize it enough, at the last, last, last step when the tooth is completely loose. We do not use forceps for a traumatic protocol. So what's a periotome? A periotome uh, is an instrument with a long, sharp shank. Uh, it is used to cut away the PDL, the periodontal fiber. Basically, if you remove the periodontal fiber, you remove, you eliminate the holding mechanism of the tooth. This will allow the tooth to be extracted along its uh, long uh, axis. And it prevents me from all of this bucolingual, bucopalatal yanking uh, that, that, that needs to be done. How do we use it? Very simple, parallel to the long axis of the tooth. From the buccal, from the mesia, from the proximal, you can go even from the palatal, never go from the buccal, start off slowly and apply apical pressure. Don't apply too much pressure at the beginning. You know, sharp instruments and then and pressure uh, and a lot of force that don't uh, coincide. Okay, and just, you will feel the instrument going deeper and deeper in the sulcus. That means that you're cutting away the, the, the PDL uh, fibers. Then, uh, of course, uh, we have the luxator, which is very similar uh, to the elevator, only it has a much thinner shank. Now, in my practice, I don't use elevators at all. I don't want them, I don't need them, uh, not for me. I, everything, every indication, every extraction is done with the luxator. Uh, if my personal favorites, I always use uh, three major types. It's three millimeter uh, thickness, 3.5 and 4.5. Uh, the one that I use the most is the middle one, the 3.5 millimeter uh, thick shank thickness. Um, it just uh, works for most indications in my hand. And as I said, it has a thin shank. And this allows me to have a fulcrum point in between the root and the alveolus. Okay, not necessarily, I don't have to have a fulcrum on the, ad on the adjacent teeth. And it, of course, used to fully look at the tooth being extracted. And we use it either uh, along the, the, the long axis of the tooth or more of a, of a um, traditional matter. Now, look at this case. This is a lower second molar. The adjacent first molar is missing. Here I already dissected the, the separated the, the root. And I know that uh, due to the existence of the, the wisdom tooth of the third molar, I have a fulcrum point, right? I can just use it in a, in a very straightforward fashion, 90 degrees, rotate it. And it's my, sorry, can you just mute okay. everybody? Uh, Yasmin and, and uh, Amit. Uh, so you can just uh, rotate it and it will uh, pop. Uh, most likely from, from the medial part. What about this area? I don't have any fulcrum. Now imagine uh, engaging it with an elevator. It will be a nightmare. You will have to remove some bone. But here, all I have to do is just jiggle it in. I will find the spot and you will find the spot and it goes out without a problem. The third uh, major instrument is the surgical burr tungsten carbide or, or just carbide burrs on the right hand side of your screen this is called a zakaria the other ones every manufacturer has a different uh, numbering system i prefer this uh, configuration i prefer to have only the optical part cutting meaning that if i have some contact with the gingiva with the with the tongue uh, with the adjacent tooth with the cheek whatever i will not rip it open i will not cut it away i will just maybe a little bit braze it but we, we, we sometimes can live with it. Of course, we need to pay uh, close attention to provide it, but this is just another safety measure. measure. And um, make sure that you are using sharp new burrs, right? Because uh, like a kitchen knife, um, a sharp burr is a safe burr. If it's dull, then you're forcing it. You're applying pressure and then you have more chances of slipping and hitting uh, some, uh, some
structures that are not meant to be hit. And also make sure that, that, uh, that they are long. I usually use 27 or 29 uh, millimeter long uh, burrs. Okay, so uh, they're used uh, for multi-rooted teeth separation, single-rooted teeth dissection, and minor osteotomies. Very, very minor. And remember this, the bone belongs to the patient. The tooth belongs to me. I extracted it, it's mine now. The bone belongs to the patient and I wanna be as minimal, minimally aggressive as possible. So uh, this is how I use them. This is a lower uh, first molar. Note that I am not going all the way to the lingual. I'm not all, uh, separating it or the, the, yeah, I'm not doing the separation. Main check. Uh, please uh, mute because uh, I hear some people talking and it's hard to focus. Uh, so I always uh, separate about 80 to 90% of the tooth. This area, the lingual area is very rich in, in uh, blood vessels. I don't want to have the, uh, slightest option of, of hitting it because then we will have bleeding and it's potentially life threatening. Yeah, sure. so, so I always, um, I always try to, uh, uh, to go about 90% and then I finish the, the, the separation you know where this came from. Uh, I did this the route and in this case, uh, we go on to perform an immediate implant. Uh, we have a very nice septum here. In other cases, we use them uh, for dissection of single rooted teeth. Okay, uh, and I will give you that the protocol exactly and uh, show you how we use them. Now, uh, this is the time. Uh, th this is the final part of, of, of the lecture. This is the time where you do the print screens, where you screenshot, where you photograph it. Uh, I'm going to show you the, the, the atraumatic protocol. And uh, I made three, uh, three parts of it according to, to the tooth segment. So the anterior teeth, and it's regardless of whether it's a maxillary or a mandibular uh, anterior teeth. First, I use the periotome to cut away the PDL, just like I showed you before. Then I use the luxator along the uh, long axis of the tooth to luxate it. Now, if the tooth is ankylosed, there's still, I don't know, there's some anatomical distractions in, in the root or whatever, and it's not moving. We decoronate it and use a burr. We decoronate, meaning we, we remove the crown. We use a burr to dissect it in a mesio. Always I do a mesio distal uh, the dissection, not a, uh, bucolingual, bucopalatal uh, dissection. And when the root is completely mobile, or when the tooth is completely mobile, only then I can remove it with, with, with forces, but I never uh, apply this uh, palatal or bucopalatal, bucolingual uh, rotation, okay? And again, remember, the tooth belongs to the surgeon. The bone belongs to the patient. Make sure that uh, uh, you follow this guideline. So here's an example. This is a lateral incisor. And in this case, the, 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 the patient, as you, as you can see, if we go back, is not taking good care of his teeth. And all I had to do is place deep my, my uh, periotome and it just pop, popped out. That's it. And um, easy extraction. Now, this patient was referred to me by, from, uh, from a peri uh, periodontist. Uh, he has a vertical root fracture. We have a pro and exudate, and they decided that um, that uh, this tooth uh, is hopeless. Though this tooth um, is not endodontically treated, it's not necessarily vital, but it's not endo treated. So we have also uh, lovely grafting material. Now uh, I try to place the periotome somewhere here. Nothing. I try to place um, uh, the the luxator on the um, on the proximal. Uh, context. All I got is slight movements of the adjacent teeth. So what do you do now? Nothing is moving. You take four steps and you go to town, right? Wrong. Remember, if it's not moving, decoronate it and dissect it. And now I'm uh, treating this tooth as a multi-rooted tooth. I first extract the palatal side, then the buccal side. Sometimes if 
let's say the book or the power or whatever part is not mobile, we can furthermore dissect it. Okay, so this is, imagine, this is the, 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 the palatal area. And I furthermore dissect it, and I remove the, the, uh, the tooth in three, three parts, one, two, and the palatal. Now, uh, believe me, I'm an oral surgeon, and I don't use the turbine uh, that, that, that often. If I can do it, everyone can. Make sure that you're going all the way to the apex. If you're not sure, then do an x-ray like and don't leave the, the, the instrument inside and do an x-ray. Uh, this will tell you if you reach the apex or no. Anyway, you should feel it uh, because the, the, the consistency, the hardness of, of the tooth is much harder than, than, than bone. Bone is much softer. Uh, so just make sure that you go all the way. This, this is very, very important. Now, uh, look at this patient. Okay, and I'm talking about, about this tooth. So um, the plan here is to extract, this is a canine, very long root. Of course, canines have long root, especially in the upper jaw. And the plan is to extract and place an implant and place an implant, an immediate implant here. Well, this is a very difficult case because this is my mother-in-law and uh, she lives abroad and we have to stick to the plan and even worse, her uh, prosthetic doctor was assisting me, and her prosthetic doctor, uh, his, her prosthodontist is my wife. So <laughs> you, can, you can imagine that I have my wife assisting me, my mother-in-law in the chair. Everything has to be right. Look at the situation. I don't think that anyone can say that this is an easy extraction. It's not an easy extraction. We don't have any adjacent teeth. Here what it is, it's a, it's a um, temporary filling. This tooth um, is contraindicated to use for, uh, for uh, grafting because uh, she had some um, <clears throat> devitalizing paste that put into, into the root. So uh, it's, it's a big no-no. And difficult uh, situation to begin with. But we place the periotome. We can, uh, I, I was able to uh, force it in a little bit on the distal. On the mesial, nothing, nothing, no way to, 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 to breach uh, the, the sulcus. Now we're dealing with a crownless, ankylosed, long-rooted canine, hard case. But look how easy we can solve it with the right technique. We do a dissection. This is where the, the long birds come in handy. Very easily, I remove the palatal segment. And then with a luxator, I remove from the same area where I reached in with, with my periotone. I remove the, the buccal part and we go on placing the implant. This is the buccal, obviously, this is the palatal on the um, singular area. So um, a potentially, not a potential, a difficult case, a challenging case that took me three or four minutes to extract not because I'm amazing, I'm a very uh, average, I think, surgeon, but because I'm using the right technique, and believe me, you guys can do it uh, as well. Just have the right instruments for that. What about premolars? So uh, pay attention to the first upper uh, premolar. It usually has uh, two separate roots. Uh, we, we all know this, this shape sometimes a lot of times, actually, you find the septa after you, after you remove them. Um, so, of course, after analyzing the, the x-ray, we, we can determine it. And uh, we just use the same uh, surgical burr and uh, separate them and just extract it uh, from, uh, from the point of view that it's a single rooted tooth. Of course, before you start uh, dissect, dissecting the, the root, use the periotome to cut away the PDL site. Okay, and be weary of the lower premolars, especially the second lower premolars. They're quite often very close to the mental uh, foramen, mental loop, mental nerve. Uh, so pay close attention not to go through the apex and not to go through the buccal area. And another thing that I wanna emphasize, an extraction has to be, we have to be able to manage an extraction flapless. Do not raise a flap. When we are raising a flap, we are cutting away the, the, 
uh, periost, uh, periostium from from the buccal uh, uh, from the from the buccal uh, plate. We'll have bone loss. We will lose uh, the, the uh, uh, keratinized tissue. We will lose the uh, emergence profile. We anyway will lose some of it, but without it, we, if we raise the flap, then we just increase the risk of of, of uh, bone resorption and so on and so on. So make sure that uh, you keep your extraction flatless. So uh, how do we approach them? Again, we have a theoretically diff difficult case, right? Look at this decay. It's a very badly decayed uh, first molar. Like I said, two roots, two separate roots. Uh, we have fulcrum here. However, you can imagine just placing an instrument, you will just remove small uh, bits. We all know this feeling where you start luxating and you just remove the, these decayed uh, particles. And I cannot use the distal area for uh, for fulcrum because look at this we have some old filling i will apply a little bit of pressure and pfft, everything cracks so this is a hard extraction and look how easy we can solve it just dissect it remove the mesial the, uh, sorry remove the buccal root then remove the palatal root and go on with our life what about molars so um i am doing this protocol to each molar, unless it's a uh, third degree or second degree mobility is I can just uh, pluck it out with, with, with my finger. Every molar, regardless of whether I'm placing an implant, I'm, the patient is going back to his restorative dentist or whatever, if I won't even see the patient, every molar, upper or lower, I, I extract using this protocol in the first stages to decorinate the root, the, the tooth, then we separate uh, the roots. We do a hemisection or a T-section, trisection in the upper jaw. We remove each root in separately using a luxator. And we all know this feeling. Sometimes one of the roots uh, or neither of them is moving. We just further more dissect the root. And I will show you that in a second. Okay, so this case you already seen before, about 80%, 90% of the separation. I don't go all the way lingually. I don't want to risk it. I finished the, the fracture with, with, the, with the luxator. Always tell the patient, don't, don't, don't get frightened. You'll hear a crack. It should be. The sound is normal. We remove the mesial uh, part. We remove the distal part. And in this case, like I said, we went on for immediate implant placement. Look at this patient. Uh, I really wanted to show you this. Uh, well, she came to me with a um, failed bridge. Okay, we obviously have nothing to do with these teeth. And um, analyzing the x-ray, we can see that this one, the, 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 the wisdom tooth has been tilted uh, due, to the, due to the three unit bridge that was previously on it. Look at the uh, periodontal space, quite wide. So we know that we shouldn't have a problem. We just apply the luxator in this area when we will remove the tooth and it was like this. Now look at the first molar. Where's the PDL? We have an ankylosed tooth and we quite often see ankylosed and uh, odontically treated uh, teeth that were used for, for uh, holding bridges as an embutment teeth. She comes to me, she had these implants uh, with a colleague uh, quite a while back. They look excellent. But she tells me, uh, doctor, listen, it's now or never. I want to have immediate implant placement here because I suffered a lot, a lot, a lot. This experience was very, very traumatic for me. I was swelling. I was in pain for a couple of weeks. I will not go back to you again. Like if you cannot place the implant uh, uh, immediately, then just leave the, the, the area eventually. No pressure, right? We have to make it and we have to rely on our technique. So here I extracted the, the I mean, extracted already the wisdom tooth and I did the separation. I know that the mesial part will be a little bit easier because I have fulcrum and it was, I extracted it uh, quite easily. If we go back, I raise the flap only um, to expose the area of future implantation. The flap ends somewhere around here. I don't raise the flap all the way to the extracted tooth. 
okay, as you, as you, as you can see. This is the septum, okay, this is the, uh, the, the septum. What I did is I just took the burr, I went in all the way to the apex, dissected uh, the, the mesial part, removed the lingual aspect, removed the buccal, and look at this beautiful uh, septum. Traditionally, what are we taught? That in a case like this, maybe raise the flat, maybe don't, take a burr and just go around it, right? In a circum circumfession, circumferential uh, manner and uh, remove it until uh, you are able to luxate it and to find some fulcrum. Nope, forget about it. No osteotomy, the tooth belongs to you, to us, to me, to the surgeon, to the whoever is performing the extraction. The bone belongs to the patient. Try to avoid that as much as possible, especially if we're going for immediate implant placement. So uh, I was able to uh, nicely extract this tooth. We basically took a difficult extraction and solved it with the right technique and instrument. And it took about seven minutes uh, to do. And look at this nice septum. We go on placing two implants and a happy patient, happy doctor. What about operatives? Uh, so uh, again, every uh, molar, I do the same. First, make sure that you decoronate it, uh, especially if, if you have some uh, ILM, some um, temporary uh, filling material, remove it. Do a tree section, T section, however you want to call it. Make sure uh, that you don't go too, much, too deep. You want to preserve the septum. Again, if you're not sure, do an X-ray, although you, you feel it. I always start with the, with the buccal root. Uh, always the palatal root will be the last one because it's the largest. Here I extracted the, the mesial, then I went on to the distal and the palatal. I end up with this and using denser burrs of identification, I perform, performed a uh, closed sinus lift, placed an implant, and we did preserve uh, these uh, sockets by fabricating, by grafting them and fabricating uh, using flow composite and temporary peak uh, abutment. In this case, it's a temporary healing abutment. Uh, use, uh, from peak, uh, make sure that this healing abutment, I call it individual uh, healing abutment, some authors call it SSA, socket seal abutment, make sure, call it wherever you want, make sure that you highly, highly polish it uh, to allow uh, biology to work without a problem. This is uh, what we uh, 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 give to the patient and she comes back four months later Look at this, look at this beauty. Beautiful emergence profile. We were able to preserve all the tissue. Well, we fabricated uh, uh, ceramic fustus zirconium uh, UCLA type uh, bridge with a very highly polished uh, um, color according to the bone, zero bone loss concept. This is the emergence profile, beautiful. And this is the patient, happy patient. Happy doctor, this is the, the final x-ray. So again, talking about green dentistry, um, this is one of the cases as I show you from uh, at, the, at the beginning. This lady in her 50s uh, came like this. Uh, I placed an immediate implant here. She had a vertical fracture, a vertical root fracture in the lower first molar. I placed an implant. She didn't want to do anything else, even though I advised her to, to, to get rid of these teeth. Said, okay, I will do it in, in a month and two, everything will be okay. And she disappeared, like uh, we often get. She comes back almost a year later, and uh, doctor, I want you to, to put the prosthetic on it. At that time, at the time that, uh, that this photo was taken, we already had pearl and texodic. We have pus running from, from this impacted wisdom tooth. This tooth cannot be held in place, it's all uh, decayed. So listen, lady, I'm very, very sorry. It's my way or the highway. Either we extract these. If you want, I will place another implant here. Uh, but these teeth have to go. If you do not want, then you have an implant passport. Everything is okay. You can find a, doc a different doctor. Uh, I cannot do something that's against my, my philosophy. Said, so, you know what? I trust you. Do, do whatever you need. So uh, we exposed uh, the, the, the wisdom. Now, look, at, look at the 
again, because of Corona, I cannot reach the office to show you the pre-op uh, uh, x-ray, yeah? But look at the, the angulation. Look at, this is the second molar. So can you imagine the angulation is like this? Extracted it, beautiful grinding, uh, beautiful grafting material. We uh, mix it up with uh, some uh, LPRF exudate, graft it, one stage surgery always on, let's say 95% of my immediate implant placement cases are one stage. Again, we uh, cover it with the LPRF membrane and voila, amazing, amazing, amazing result. Okay, this is the emergence profile and this is the, the final uh, prosthetic. And again, look at the x-rays. You cannot differentiate the host from the graft. Amazing. Again, green dentistry, this lady, and we only have a few more cases and uh, we, we will be done for today. I'll just have a sip of water if you don't mind. So uh, this lady came to the office, also referred uh, for uh, extraction of uh, wisdom teeth. She had some pericornitis. She's already uh, in her late 40s. You don't want to keep uh, these uh, teeth in the mouth. You don't want to have the possibility of, of uh, some kind of infection in this age next to the throat. Just take them out and, doctor, what do you think uh, uh, we should do with these teeth? Said, what do you mean? Extract them and place an implant. Here, if you look at the first molar, uh, first pre, uh, second, sorry, second premolar. It looks quite close to the, to the mental foramen, but we had a CBCT and uh, we verified that we are, have a safe distance. So we decided to go for a stage approach and I'll just show you um, uh, one side. Stage approach meaning that we do one side then a few weeks after we do the other side just for the patient's comfort. So uh, this is the way that she came in. Okay, you can see the wisdom teeth. You can see the teeth uh, that had to be extracted. There is no, no discussion here. We extracted the wisdom. We extracted uh, the teeth to be extracted. This little bit also was removed. Look at this wisdom tooth, beautiful grafting material. It's not medical waste, it's green dentistry. So we place two implants with PRF um, uh, ponchos, closed it up, and again, green, green, dentistry, no biomaterials, no expensive biomaterials, very comfortable, uh, eventful healing for, for our patients, happy patients, happy surgeon. Uh, another case of green dentistry. So this patient uh, came uh, for extraction of, uh, he's a male in his uh, 50s, smoker, uh, came for extraction of uh, anterior lower uh, five um, anterior teeth from this came until the lateral incisor. Already we can see here uh, a defect. And this is the clinical view, obviously not the best uh, oral hygiene. We extracted uh, these teeth. Of course, uh, oral hygiene uh, education is essential. It's really essential to, 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 to success and we really, uh, post up our patients and make sure that, that they keep uh, good oral hygiene. And, and they do, they do, they usually do because they're, they're already motivated. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you why. So uh, look at these beautiful teeth, medical waste. Nope, it's green dentistry. Uh, we will uh, grind them, disinfect them and use them. Here, I said, be flapless, but because we have a defect, and I also wanted to flatten out a little bit these bone, bony interproximal uh, peaks. So we raised a uh, flap with one uh, distal uh, releasing incis uh, incision. I very rarely do two releasing incisions. I do an envelope flap uh, like you see. Uh, I think that the vascularization of a flap design like this is uh, superior. We placed, go on placing three implants. This defect was grafted with, of course, our autogenous dentine, covered with some uh, PRF. We um, splinted the transfers, took a, a open tray impression. And usually this is my protocol for immediate uh, loading. 
um, the patient comes five days after we remove the sutures. I usually don't do it in the same day because, uh, or, or the, the, the following day we have still swelling, edema. I prefer to wait uh, five days, five to seven days. He comes, we place the multi-unit abutment and we provide him with a fixed, uh, with a fixed uh, bridge. Now, this is a much better uh, situation than what he started. Usually when they see this, it motivates them. And this is the motivation for them to keep good oral hygiene uh, along with our uh, instruction. Another case of green dentistry, terminal dentition, nothing to do here. The patient cannot afford a fixed uh, solution. So we decided to go for biomaxillary uh, removable dentures over locators. So uh, we have uh, sensibilization agent from the implant. Now, one looks at this and says, okay, extract. I'm looking at this and saying, grafting material, perfect, green dentistry. So in this case, I wasn't able to, to, to draw blood from him. It was just impossible to find vein. Whatever I did, I tried from here, I tried. Impossible. So I just aborted it and, uh, and I know the, the properties of dentin. Dentin, unlike other materials, does not encapsulate. So you don't have to use a membrane for barrier, okay? As, as a barrier uh, from uh, soft tissue infiltration, from, from, fiber, from fibroblast infiltration, you just can leave it without a membrane and it will heal without a problem. Knowing that, I approached the surgery. We extracted the teeth. Again, go flapless, but because we are going uh, for a removable denture, we need to prepare the platform so we raise the flap and uh, flatten out the, the, the alveolus, did an alveolectomy. Even though it's for a removable denture, we still place the implant in the correct prosthetic position in the palatal area. This is the second implant, this is the third implant. Beautiful grinding, beautiful uh, green dentistry material. Grind it up, disinfect it. Look at the amount. This is a huge amount, really. And we just fill up and close it. Now, the plan is that within about three weeks, two weeks after, the restorative doctor will start uh, preparing the removal prosthetic. And within about two, uh, two months after, he will already start wearing the, 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 the prosthetic. And four months after surgery, we uncover it and, and directly uh, connect it uh, with, with the locator system. What are you doing, Avi? Is everything okay with you? You're going to place a um, removable denture over a, grind, over a grafted area? What's wrong with you? Why, why, why are you doing this? Well, first of all, I know that it's not going to be immediately. It's going to be about two months after. And I know that dentine integrates very, very fast. So I was confident enough to do it and look at the time of exposure. Where are the implants? Where are they? Look at this. This is how a grafted area should look. Live, real, bleeding bone. Here I have to dig out this implant. They use the burr uh, to remove it. And this is <coughs> the case every time. And again, I'm not selling you some fancy membrane or some fancy bone material. Autogenous green dentistry. And this is about six months or seven months uh, after he was already uh, had the, uh, the, the, the denture connected with, with the lo locators and this x-ray is at the time of uncovery. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Now, uh, the last case that I'm going to share with you uh, is how I approach third molar extractions. I know that for some, for, for some of you, it's interested because I get a lot of questions about them. So uh, first, what we need to do is analyze the x-ray. Okay, we have a, almost a completely a vertically impacted uh, molar tooth. It is seen inside the oral cavity. And the game plan is like this. First of all, we do a coronectomy. We remove the, the, uh, the crown, analyzing the x-ray. Then we will find the fulcrum point somewhere here. And if we still have no movement, then we go on to hemisect the tooth and remove it uh, remove each root separately. So as long as we have a plan, uh, we're good to go. 
so this is the, the, the situation. Hey, this is the flap design. Now, note, please, I'm doing the flap from the buccal area. I never go mid-crestally. And lingually, there's not even not a discussion. You cannot do it because in some cases, some authors even state 18% uh, prevalence. Me, uh, I think that this number, I don't know how they got it. It's much lower, but still, I don't want to uh, risk the op the possibility of damaging the lingual nerve, okay, leaving the the, the patient paralyzed. Uh, I mean, not paralyzed, but leaving the the, the tongue without sensation. It's 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 terrible uh, for 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 the patient. So what I do, this is the flap outline. I try always uh, to go without a releasing vertical incision, and I try not to go through the papilla the mesial papilla of the second molar. So the flap is relatively small. However, I'm working with, with nice magnification. I can see everything. You will be able to see everything. And I don't see the need for it. So I try to preserve this papilla. Um, so this is what we get. And this is the clinical situation. Now the next step to do is to perform a bone gutter. We're going from the, uh, a little bit distally from the buccal area with a burr, and uh, we're just making a bony gutter. Another tip that I can share with you, uh, dear colleagues, is that um, uh, before I start guttering the, the bone, I place somewhere the, the luxator, and I just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, let's say the tooth, because I want after I separate everything, after I finish all the separation, for the area already to be luxated and, and, and free. So uh, I do the bone guttering, then like we uh, established, I go for the coronectomy and I place uh, my luxator in this area, find the fulcrum, and I was lucky enough for it to pop out quite simply. Again, look at how much grafting material I have there. That, that's a lot, that's a lot of grafting material from one molar Tooth. I graph the area, three sutures, four sutures. Again, no need for fancy membranes, uh, no need for, uh, you can do it with, with PRF. There's no problem with that. Only in our study, we didn't want to combine it with PRF. We wanted to show that you can strictly do it only with, with dentin. Now imagine, uh, from a perspective point of view, this will work with whatever biomaterial that you are using. However, uh, if you want to use allograft, and in this case, I wouldn't want to use xenograft. I want to use something that turns over uh, completely. Uh, I will need to use at least one CC, right? And I will need to cover it with a collagen membrane. These things cost money, and I end up charging the patient at least twice for the same procedure, at least twice, if not three times more, because I cannot pay for, for, for it from my uh, pocket. And the patient will look at me. We're usually dealing, uh, as I said, with young patients. And say, what are you talking about? Like my, 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 my colleague, my uh, classmate, my cousin got his wisdom tooth extractor with all of this mumbo jumbo. Now you want to charge me three times more? What the hell? Um, and with Cometa Bio, uh, the, the, the cost to, re to ratio is very, very, uh, logical, and I, I would say eight, nine uh, times out of 10 patients agree for the extra when you explain to them how it's beneficial for the, for the long run. So uh, this is the last uh, topic that I wanted to show you. Thank you very much for your attention. Please, everybody, stay home, stay safe, wash your hands. This is uh, my Facebook, Avi Kuperschlag, Instagram. You can find me at uh, Dr. Avi Kuperschlag. This is my email. Please uh, feel free to contact me uh, if necessary, if you want to discuss something and so on and so on. So thank you very much. And Amit, I give you the, the stage. Okay. Okay, Dr. Ku Dr. Kuperschla, can you hear me? You can, okay, very good. Wonderful, uh, first, thank you very much. This was, uh, this was fascinating, it was great, appreciate it.
Uh, we did get uh, we did get a few questions throughout, and I'd like to go back to them and um, and then maybe answer a few more that are coming in now. So uh, first one is uh, can we uh, when we uh, when we clean up the tooth after the extraction using bur using a burr just like you showed, uh, do we leave the cementum on top or not? And uh, the the answer is I'll I'll take it Avi unless unless CS mean you can unmute Avi as well, uh, but uh, definitely you can leave the cementum on the tooth uh, that will basically resorb fairly quick. Cementum resorbs really quick uh, as a granule as part of the part particulate, so absolutely no issue there. And when you are cleaning the tooth before you placing it in the smart dentin grinder, uh, you basically have to take off any, so any soft tissue, any gingiva, PDL, and, and of course, any restoration. So if there's amalgam, usually the amalgam is easier to take out when the tooth is still in the mouth, just as a tip. Uh, but um, any other restoration, any sort of uh, filling or composites, you need to take that out. Uh, but as far as the cementum, you can definitely leave that there. It will typically take you about, I would say about two minutes, one to two minutes, depending on the shape of the tooth, uh, to clean it up before you can uh, place that in, in the grinder, okay? If the tooth is fairly nice, fairly clean, it will take you a ma matter of a few seconds. Second question was about- hey, Amit, uh, if, 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 you, if I may, uh, sure. this is a very common question that I get about cementum and about enamel. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much every other person asks me about it. Uh, the enamel uh, always comes up, and uh, I, I have a, my opinion about enamel is that I leave it because enamel at the bottom line is hydro hydroxyapatite, uh, which is very similar to xenograft. However, uh, practically speaking, we do not use the enamel because the enamel is, as is, the crystals are very, very brittle. And the grinding process makes them so brittle that they're uh, usually below the 250 micron level. So we have very little enamel if is. However, no problem of using it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As far as the cleansing, there was a question about, can we use the autoclave in, or, in order to uh, sterilize uh, the grafting material? Uh, I'll just give the brief, uh, brief answer and then Avi, you can, uh, Dr. Kuperstag, you can, you can uh, elaborate. But our recommendation is no, do not use your autoclave. Uh, the protocol comes with uh, a cleanser kit, which is a dentin cleanser. It's a uh, high pH uh, liquid that does an excellent job on completely disinfecting the particulate. In fact, when we check it afterwards, it's, it's uh, the same as sterilizing it because you've got nothing, no bacteria is left. Uh, the great thing about our cleanser is that it will maintain the BMPs, the growth factors and the collagen that are embedded in the particulate. So it's actually very effective while maintaining uh, the properties of the dentin, okay? So, but th the most important thing is really the wash. So after you go through the five minutes of the dentin cleanser, you then have to wash out the particulate using PBS, which is, again is part of the kit. And then that will basically rinse away uh, the, the, the cleanser and will bring the dentin graft back to pH, pH 7.2, which is uh, the, the biological pH you want to introduce the graft back into the site at. Yeah, so um, I completely agree. Uh, also, logically speaking, uh, autoclave, uh, is, is a heat and pressure uh, chamber, basically. Um, autoclave kills cells. We want to keep these uh, BMPs, these growth factors in there. Uh, now, one interesting uh, uh, thing that we discovered in our study is that uh, at least at the beginning, uh, when patients came back uh, seven days uh, post-operatively for uh, suture removal, they filled out a questionnaire. And a lot of them reported more swelling than the control group from using dentin. And uh, what I found out is that we didn't emphasize enough after we use the cleanser, and I emphasize cleanser, make sure that you uh, soak away the excess cleanser with the gut thoroughly. It will take you three more seconds, but just pay more attention to that. And only then apply the first uh, coat, the, 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 the first uh, dose of PVS, 
soak it and apply the second coat. This actually neutralizes it. And uh, I think that our mistake uh, was that we didn't uh, dry enough uh, the graft after, uh, after we use the cleaning on it. So learn from my mistake, make sure that you dry it uh, thoroughly and go through two cycles of, PDA, of, of PBA. Uh, another question came up earlier uh, when you presented the smart dent and grinder is can we use the, the particulate if we have leftover, can we use it for later on? So of course, many times we would graft the site, uh, but then we know we might need to have more graft uh, for once we place the implant, if we're, not, if we're doing a delayed placement, delayed implant placement. And uh, the answer for that is definitely you can. It actually saves really, really nice, and you can save the graft, the excess graft that you're preparing uh, for many, many years. And there's some studies that show that, uh, that, that, that show why this is so. Uh, the one thing to remember though, and we do have a protocol for how to do it, is that you really need to dry the graft completely. Whatever you have left over, you need to completely dry the graft and then store it in a safe place with the name of the patient. You can only use it for that same patient. You cannot use it for anybody else. You can't use it for a family member. Uh, of that patient, only for that specific patient. That's, an, uh, that's another question we get asked a lot. And then remember that when the patient comes back, let's say four months later, six months later for the implant, and you wanna use the graft then, you have to repeat the cleansing process. So at that point, just before the, the surgery, you want your assistant to use the dentin cleanser and then the wash, make sure it's again, absolutely clean, just in case you know, something happened to it along the way and then you can use it, then you can use it again. Completely agree. Uh, another question came up here is, can we use the graph if we don't have enough for any reason? If we were doing a big site, let's say we're doing a, a, a full ridge, can we mix it with other graphs? Can we mix it with synthetics? Can we mix it with xeno or allografts? And uh, the, the, the answer to that is absolutely you can. So it doesn't have to, you don't have to just use that. If you want to mix it up with something else, just because you need more or for any other reason, you can certainly mix it. Is that your, is that how, did you try that before, yeah. Dr. Cooper? Well, I mean, I mean uh, the answer is a huge yes. And um, let's think about what we're dealing with. We're dealing with autogenous graft. Don't treat it as dentine. Treat it as autogenous graft. One of the most, uh, well-published follow-up uh, types of GBR, especially uh, lately the team of Boozer uh, from uh, Switzerland has published the, the book of 30 years of GBR. They're calling it the composite graft, right? That we first layer use autogenous uh, bone chips and on top of the xenograft. Instead of scraping for autogenous bone chips, use the dentin on top, place the xenograft, uh, collagen membrane, you're good to go. Okay, good. Uh, another question came up is uh, for large sites. So if we're not doing a socket, if we're doing a large uh, defect, let's say a large period defect that we're trying to. So you mentioned Dr. Cooper Schlag that you're not using in, the, in quite a few indications. I see mostly so sockets. You're not using a membrane. You don't find the need to use a membrane, but then in the large, in the large defects you do. Uh, can, you, can you talk more about, about that? Of course. Of course, so, so this is the question that also I get a lot, asked a lot. And uh, in order to answer it properly, we need to uh, think about what is the purpose of using a membrane, okay? Um, so we have pretty much uh, two major, we have a little bit more than that, but two major indications. The first indication is graft stabilization, because we all know this is the first lesson that we learn uh, when we're uh, studying GBR, that the graft has to be stable. In that case, we're using a membrane, we're fixing the mem fixating the membrane, whether it's uh, periosteal sutures, whether it's pin tags, uh, membrane tags, stabilization tags like I like to do. And in that case, it, it doesn't matter which uh, material we're using because we have a mechanical property of, uh, of, of, uh, of the membrane that holds all of this uh, graft material in place. For example, if you look at the sausage technique by Ishtavan Urban. But uh, the, the other uh, indication is to, to have a barrier 
from, and I a little bit uh, talked about it, from uh, infiltration of soft tissue cells, mainly uh, fibroblasts. Now, dentin, as is, do not get encapsulated. So uh, these fibroblasts have no uh, clinical significance for me. And in that case, for example, if I'm just doing a simple socket, I can even uh, place a, 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 a hemostatic sleeve on top of it, an X suture just to hold everything in place so we don't uh, have it running away, and it will heal. My best uh, scenario is to use PRF, but as a membrane, as is, classically speaking, to use, this, to use a membrane as a barrier, uh, whether it's resolvable or, un or unresolvable, it's, it is not necessarily when, uh, when necessary when using dentin. Okay. Uh, there was a question a few minutes ago, um, and uh, the question is, what is the difference between dentin graft and demineralized dentin graft for remodeling new bone? So... Let me uh, let me let me take this one because this is a big question and we get yeah, the, it's, it's very all big all the time. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussions around this, and I'll just uh, again I'll just explain what the question is. Uh, the question is basically about the difference between mineralized dentin graft and demineralized dentin graft. And uh, on the market, uh, we Cometa Bio we offer two protocols, uh, but there's other companies that offer fully demineralized dentin graft uh, uh, protocol. So uh, the, big, the big difference is the scaffold. So when we demineralize dentin, we're basically eliminating most of the mineral and we are, uh, and we are exposing the collagen. So the great thing about this is that you get collagen exposure earlier on, earlier on, and then, and so you get more uh, new bone regenerated early on. But the, the downside, mm -hmm is that you're losing a lot of mineral. And the mineral we, we know is very important for the scaffold. You want the scaffold and you want the slow resorption. And Dr. Kuperschlag highlighted it earlier on. The slow resorption is so important because that is what's gonna get all your woven immature bone and will support it to, uh, for the bone to turn to lamellar bone, lamellar bone, mature bone, which is really what you want because it's really only the mature bone, the lamellar bone, uh, when, it, the, 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 when it becomes really self-sustaining. So uh, you're losing that with when you're completely demineralizing your dentin graft. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have done about two years ago, we have introduced another protocol, a second protocol. So our standard protocol is still mineralized dentin graft. So you're getting the, the scaffold, the, the slow resorption, everything we just talked about. Great, okay? Very predictable. But in some cases, you do want to, uh, what we call, accelerate your new bone regeneration, especially for patients uh, that are, you, we know are going to be slow healers, such as your smokers, your diabetics, your medicated you know, patients just, just, uh, you know, went through cancer treatments uh, or just old. You know these patients are going to heal slow. So for, the, for that, we have developed a new protocol. Again, not so new, about two years ago. We call it partial demineralized dentin. And what, really what we do, we introduce another step, uh, which is based on EDTA. It adds two minutes to the protocol. And that will really give you partial demineralized, about 20% demineralized, 80% mineralized graft. So you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the early exposure of collagen, but you're also getting your scaffold. Okay. Well, uh, personally, um, I remember talking to you two years ago and you told me about this and yeah, I'll send you this. And you know, with the patients that I'm expecting slower healing, I just wait a little bit longer. I just had a month, a couple of months. I never had a patient that told me, I have to have this uh, restored within uh, three months, not four. Never happened thus far. Uh, usually these patients that heal from, from a clinical point of view, uh, that heal slower, that we're expecting them to heal slower, they're more understanding of, of the situation. You explain to them that the, the medical issues and they're less keen of doing everything now fast 
and so on and so on. So it would be great uh, maybe to try it out, uh, maybe to do some, uh, some research about it. And yeah, well, why not? But uh, this protocol with, with fully mineralized uh, just works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kubishlag, uh, there's a question here for you from, uh, from uh, Dr. Manish. Uh, could you please go over your technique to make the custom healing abutments using flowable composite? Uh, you know what? Uh, I actually even have a video of this, uh, just uh, not, not on this computer. Basically, what you do, and it's a little bit hard to, to describe with words. Um, it's better to, to see it, but pretty much what you do is that you um, uh, screw in a temporary abutment and you just make a flow outline with it. Uh, you fill it up and then you polish it up. Uh, just uh, write it down in YouTube and you, you, sh you should find some, uh, some videos about it because uh, explaining it in words doesn't give it uh, justice. Okay, good. Uh, let me quickly see. I think we covered most of, uh, most of the questions that were asked. Uh, where do I get the dentin cleanser? Okay, you get the dentin cleanser uh, from Cometa Bio mm -hmm. or any Cometa Bio dealer worldwide. We have dealers around the world, and uh, if you go to the website www.cometabio.com, uh, you will see a list of, of dealers, or you can contact me and I'll help you. Uh, and also, if, since I mentioned the website, there's a lot of educational pieces on the website, articles, research papers. Uh, videos. Uh, you can also go to YouTube forward slash Cometa Bio, uh, where you can see a, a lot of techniques and uh, procedures and surgeries. And there's a few more questions coming in. We'll take a couple more. And I know it's getting late, Dr. Kuperschlag, for you, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, only, it's almost midnight, but the energies are always high when we're talking about, uh, about the oral surgery. If people would like, we can do a follow-up webinar. There's plenty of topics to, to, to discuss. Yeah, okay, okay, great. So um, there's a question here. Um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Fadul, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Uh, are there any instances where we cannot use this, this technique if there is any? So here is something I know that uh, Dr. Kupischlag and I are, myself, are a little bit different on. Uh, and I'll give some background. Uh, before we, up until recently, we have contraindicated endotreated teeth. Um, we did that because we didn't have enough experience with endotreated teeth. Also, to clean up the gutta percha and the steelers is a little bit more difficult. And, it, and, and a lot of doctors just don't want to spend the time to do that. Recently, after, again, a lot of experience, we've been experience, experimenting with this now for over seven years. Uh, we have found that as long as you as a doctor, as long, as long as you know the history of the tooth, you know the type of materials that were used for the endo, for the endo treatment, and you're feeling comfortable with it, then you can, um, you can uh, vertically section the tooth and you can use a drill to clean up all the gutta percha as much as the sealers and then use it. Uh, we haven't had a single, um, a single, um, um, uh, adverse reaction uh, from all the cases we've seen with endo treated. I wouldn't start with it. Definitely not. Start with the non-endo and when you get enough experience and the, you know, again, you know the history of the tooth, you know what's, what's been done to it, then you can do it. But I, I can tell you it's going to take you a little bit more time than the seven minutes end-to-end -end or eight minutes end-to-end -end that the, the, the typical standard protocol will take. I think uh, that um, that what you're make, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. However, I think that the next step will be um, finding a very clear protocol on how to do it. Because I know that in my hands, personally, it won't work. The last time I held a file for Endo was eight years ago, maybe. Uh, I know for a fact that in my hands it won't work. But, uh, and, and, it, and it's actually interesting, we can maybe uh, try to figure out, uh, or you guys uh, can try to figure out a very exact protocol 
and yeah, and if, if if you're able to solve this problem, then then you will make a dent in a lot of biomaterial uh, companies' pockets because most of the teeth uh, will be able to use to utilize. But it needs it needs, a, in my opinion, it needs a very clear uh, cut protocol. Um, another interesting question here. Um, I'm not sure I can give the full answer on this one. Uh, but let me read this out uh, because I think it's relevant. Uh, any thoughts on patients taking biphosphonates, PPIs, SSRIs, any difference in autograft versus allograft? Uh, so uh, I, 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 get, I get asked this question and I don't have all the research here, but uh, I'll just, so I'll, you know, and I'll let Dr. Kuperschlag maybe comment as well, but as a, as a, as a general comment, Anything autologous, okay, anything autologous that was already in existence in the patient's body and you use it back and to, you bring it back in. Remember, we're not manipulating it. The only thing we do is we clean it up, we cleanse it, and we particulate it, but that's it. And that's why, uh, that's why we're getting extremely low infl inflammatory reaction, if any, and typically we believe the inflammatory reaction you are getting, the little bit you're getting is due to the surgery, is due to the surgical procedure, uh, not the graft. So in my opinion, that would, should explain or should uh, answer this question. But again, I, I, you know, we need, to, we need to look into this uh, furthermore. What do you think? So uh, first of all, I completely agree. Um, before addressing this, que uh, this question, we have to understand that Patients with bisphosphonates are contraindicated for all surgery, period, period. Unless they go through the cycle, the protocol, wait X time, um, and then you're clear to go. Now, um, having stated that, I completely agree that we would like to use autogenous. However, we have to make sure, uh, let's say, put to emphasis. Number one, is that we don't have a secondary uh, uh, surgical site, meaning I will not extract a wisdom tooth to fill in a socket for, for, uh, for a defect and so on and so on. I do not want to have a secondary uh, surgical site. So I might use it in, a, in an immediate implant where I'm able to extract and reuse it. The second, and this I learned from Professor Bindelman, uh, always 100% of the patients that are taking bisphosphonates uh, for osteoporosis, for cancer, and so on and so on. I always, 100% of the time, whenever I'm performing whatever oral surgery, whether it's a simple extraction, whether it's something more serious, I always use LPRF because the, and, 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 and um, this combination of green dentistry, of, of dentin and LPRF, is amazing because LPRF, the cytokines in there, allow the differentiation of monocytes, okay? That comes the, the derived from leukocytes. And a lot of people uh, don't think about it. We have monocytes type one that uh, are uh, differentiated in M2 into uh, monocyte uh, type two. And if they don't, this is what the, the bisphosphonates are causing this uh, lack of, of differentiation. And we're uh, dealing with a uh, chronic type of inflammation, state of state, uh, uh, inflammatory stage. So whatever you do, if your patient uh, is in the risk group for uh, for medical uh, uh, induced osteonecrosis of the jaw, use LPRF always. And with the dentine, I would always want to have something autogenous. However, never a secondary uh, surgical site. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, last question, actually one next to last uh, that came in. Uh, any, any indications where this should not be used? Um, I, I, <laughs> no. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll yeah, be honest I'll, with you. If, if, yeah, if, I have, if I have a case uh, that I know that I will need grafting and I have the opportunity uh, to to choose the, the situation allows me to choose whether to use dentin or a different grafting material. One hundred percent of the time, I will choose I will choose dentin. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to answer. 
Okay. Another question I got through text is, can you tell, can you say something more about uh, the, the, the device uh, and where we can get it? Uh, the device is called the Smart Denting Grinder by Cometa Bio. Uh, you can find out more about the device and the disposable kits uh, on uh, cometabio.com. Again, there, there's a list of dealers, or you can text us to info at cometabio.com. Uh, overall, depends, of course, on the dealer and the region, but it's under two grand. You're getting the device and you're getting uh, six disposable kits, and you're all set up for your first six cases uh, using it. And I think with that, pretty much we summed it up. Uh, again, if any additional questions beyond it, you can feel free to write to either avi.coop at gmail.com. It's on the screen. Or you can also direct those questions to info at cometabio.com and we'll make sure you get, the, you get the response. The recording, people are asking me about, can, will, this, will the recording be available? Uh, I believe so. We'll just monitor, make sure we have recorded the whole thing. I believe we did. And uh, we will post it either to YouTube or we'll send you a link so you can uh, download or view the recording again or share it with anybody that you want. Okay. So with that, Dr. Cooperstag, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, Hopefully we'll do this again. With, Much with health, everyone. Keep safe and healthy, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Stay home. Bye bye.